grad? Where did you work after you graduated? Well, I actually worked at the Honeywell Research Center, and I got the job because my wife's good friend worked there and heard that I was going to graduate and talk to his boss, and he thought it was a good idea, and they created a position for me, which which was a nice thing to happen. And so I went there and it was the gaseous electronics division and they were trying to work on what was a variation of the Geiger tube, which was right down the physicist alley. And what <clears throat> it was, it was a very small version of the Geiger tube and it had, it, quart, it was made out of quartz and the, it, the only thing it was really sensitive to was ultraviolet. And so the idea there was that ultraviolet in daily life, the only thing that, that gives that off is flames. So for Honeywell, it would be a flame detector. And, and the, the problem was to make it cheaply and, and reliably and with inspect and all that kind of stuff. So we, we have the problem of what's, what are the good piece, good kinds of metal to use inside and, and how much gas do you need inside to make it work properly and, and how do you seal it together without getting contaminants and all that kind of stuff. And, but there was a, a real lack of understanding of, of how the Geiger tube worked. They knew all the all the reasonable things you have to know, but nobody really knew how the gas discharge happened. Really? Is this just at Honeywell or is it globally? No, no that was globally. Oh. So I was in there figuring out how do you make it work so that the uh, cathode doesn't wear out uh, and stuff like that. And, and it turned out to be a, a, an unexpectedly hard problem, but there were some interesting variations to it. And at the very end of it, there was, well, it wasn't the only time, but the uh, industrial control people had a, a price they wanted on the flame detector board and with the ultraviolet Geiger tube in there it was 10 cents over budget oh and so they went with the thermocouple then did you <laughs> join another team or what happened to you in this process well there there were many different things we were looking at and, and one of the ones that came along was the smoke detector. Uh, we, we had a Fred Schlachter who had come there into the our part of the research center and he was certain that, that we could be sensitive to, to if we had a, a an ion at a low, a cloud at a low voltage, we should be able to detect some things. And, and we had worked with the uh, systems and research department and they, they were interested in detecting various kinds of gases and, and all sorts of things. And, and so as it turned out, um, we, we discovered that the uh, the amount of current through such a shell uh, uh, cell would be uh, influenced greatly by having smoke particles in it. So it had the potential for being a smoke detector. Well, there was a, a bunch of development that went on about what kind of voltage and how big, how intense does it need to be. And they ended up with a, a small radioactive piece in the middle that would ionize the gas around it to a, a, a workable amount and, and then with the right voltage across it we could optimize the sensitivity to smoke. 
Now, what was your specific contribution to this team? You became part of one of the patent holders. Yeah, there are four of us. Fred Schlachter got the, the idea, and Frank Simon worked with him on the mathematics, the, again, the partial differential equations and what was important and what wasn't important. And Jerry Rourke was the guy in the lab who put together all the equipment to make the measurements and could, could do just about anything you wanted to try something new. And I was looking at the data that came out and, and giving them a showing how it, how it matched or with their differential equations and stuff. And, and plus, uh, I, I worked with Jerry Rourke a little about how to do some things and, and with Frank Simon about some of the derivations he made, I checked them and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's the low round fire detector that you see so often. Well, the patent expired in the early 90s mm -hmm. and then, then other people got it and there's all sorts of smoke detectors out there now. Mm -hmm. And the best of them have this ionization along with a obscuration in which they see how foggy the area is and of course, you know, smoke mm -hmm. looks foggy. And so that's a, a good detector also. And, and the, there's different kinds of smoke that the two detectors are sensitive to, so, so together they make a better match. Excellent, that's excellent. Would you move on into your other roles in Honeywell? Where did you spend the most time? Well, we played a, a bit of a role in the uh, energy crisis of 79, was it, or somewhere in there, the, the, the oil embargo crisis. And they started a big thing and we got all started up on how to instrument uh, a, a room that they could actually see what was going on. Apparently the, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning people knew what happened in general, but it wasn't down in specific detail, including things like what influence does the sunshine have and what influence does the wind have and things like this. And Honeywell ended up building a, a room on top of their office building and instrumenting the whole thing and measuring what went on and including things like opening the door for uh, simulating letting the dog in and out so if several times a day and kids going in and out and all that sort of stuff trying to reduce re Were you on the computer end of that research or on the um, physics of flow end? I first got a start in the theory end of it and ended up giving myself a short course on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. And, and from that, I was then getting into the position so that when we got that, I would have some idea about what it meant. Okay. And from there on, you moved into um, the role of working with Fortran? And well, they bought a mini computer. Mm -hmm. for the lab with a real-time interface with the idea that that they could use the this mini computer for running some problems for the lab it was it was rather small compared to the to the real com the timeshare computers it uh, to most people looked like a 316 which is a very popular Honeywell mini computer at the time uh, but they bought it with a real-time interface, which turned it into a 1602, and that was kind of a rare bird. Um, and we we never, well, we did use the real-time interface for a few things now and then, but mostly we used it like a 316. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was possible to run some small problems for the lab. Uh, but mostly we were trying to figure out how to use it to support the lab equipment. And, and as typical with the new computer equipment from that era, a lot of our work ended up being how to integrate all the computer pieces. And when we get a new uh, uh, 
peripheral, we'd spend a lot of time making sure that everything went together and all that sort of stuff. And so I don't think we really did much useful work. Uh -huh. You were playing around. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but we, we were making, find, showing what we needed to make things work, and that wasn't known before. After the research center, there was kind of a hiatus. I was into a more of a managerial job where I was trying to figure out whether the divisions outlaying should be piping their data into central offices or buying self-standing computers on the outside. And after a couple of years, it became obvious that telephone prices were staying constant and computer prices were falling. So therefore, every, every division should buy their own computer. And they disassembled the huge computer they had at central offices because there was nothing for it to do anymore because mm -hmm. the data was out in the divisions. Okay. And, and when that, that also meant that we were, our job wasn't available anymore. I got a kick out of them telling us on January 10th, uh, the division, the, the, your group has been disbanded as, as of January 1st, please start looking for a job. And where did you land? Well, I ended up in defense systems in uh, Hopkins. Um, and, and I really, I, I, I went to work, I forget which group it was, but I very soon got word that there was this fellow uh, who was running a, a simulation and he was using computers a lot, Gordon Johnson. And so he actually found me because uh, he found, he's heard that somebody had been hired who knew Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I talked to him and he was doing an immense job. He, he actually uh, got a degree from the University of Minnesota in civil engineering by building a three-dimensional mechanical simulator on, on the star supercomputer. And it was two boxes of cards. And there's 2,000 cards in a box, so that's 4,000 statements. And it could run for hours on the supercomputer. <clears throat> and, and they had since then made it a two-dimensional version, rotationally symmetric, and that ran at least ten times faster. So you worked with Gordon yeah, on simulation I went to work with exercises. Gordon and, and to build, um, what, what they would do is, is model uh, things made out of metals in their libraries, and then they would, including explosives and, and and, and run them and see what happened. And, and this was a, an exceedingly tough problem, uh, but it was extremely fruitful for the company because to do a typical ordnance test up at Elk River, it takes a couple of weeks and costs maybe five to $10,000 in parts and labor and all that sort of stuff. And you could, Simulate that on a computer for a couple days of engineering time for a few hundred dollars. Hmm. So basically, that's what you did from then until the end of your career. Uh, things on that order. Things on yes. that order. Yes, and and uh, the original four thousand statements ended up at when I finally left at uh, I believe one hundred and fifty thousand. Oh my gosh. Wow, it became and more and more complicated. The computers yes. became every, more complicated. Every time they wanted to add a new feature that was a, a couple, another thousand or two cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't cards after a while. That was 
One of the things we joked Gordon about was that when they moved from one building to another, he finally left his card cabinet behind. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, by then, everything was online. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, now, you were gifted as being sort of a librarian as well. In the teams, you could figure out where everything was and how to access stuff. Am I correct? Yes, but that turned out to be a really good skill as the program got bigger because you had to organize things in the, in the program so that you could find them and you knew who did what, uh, where to find what, where things happened. So if a mistake happened, you would have certain characteristics and then you would know, oh, it's over in that routine. Mm -hmm. So you understood the mind of the computer Yes, well, I... The neurology of the computer. I could never beat Gordon. He, well, I would get confused and go and talk to him, and he would say, oh, it has to be in this routine. Look there. And so I'd go and look there, and there it was. <laughs>
this amount of work. <laughs> no, no, that's... <laughs> life goes in strange ways. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that you cozied up to computers and they became your buddies all the way through. Yeah, they they always have problems, but they uh, always seem to get better. 